this uh, idea of new work. So they start off uh, this particular interview, this podcast, around a couple principles that we'll, we'll dialogue here about. Uh, number one, this concept of a J-O-B, <laughs> uh, job, so to speak, is really only about 200 years old, and it really came about around the Industrial Revolution. We needed people to make stuff, and prior to that, individuals were farming, they were creating, they were artists, they were doing things and, and sort of living, I don't want to say making money because a lot of times there, were bar there was bartering involved and things of that nature, but they were making a living, if you will, mm -hmm. around doing things that, that drove them, so to speak, of what we call now passionate about mm -hmm. as much as possible, right? And then comes the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. and we need factories and people, mm -hmm. you know, assembling things. So what he's advocating in this new work model is that we get back to where we were prior to 200 years ago in this idea of what we now kind of call entrepreneurship and really do things that you're interested in and, and figure out how to make money at them, so to speak, ideally. And this ties into some of the other concepts that we talk about around living with less and not keeping up with the Joneses and, and whatnot. So that's one of his main points. Um, and the other main point, and then I'm gonna turn it over to you, Skylar, which I was just so, so passionate about, is uh, this whole concept of jobs really drives our government system. It's who has control. It's the corporations that employ a lot of people, AKA banking mm -hmm. and the auto industry, as we saw in 2008. And who gets the government bailout because they're worried about losing jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's all about we're exporting jobs to other countries and keeping jobs. So who's in the position of power with our economic system at this given moment? It is the big companies that <laughs> provide <laughs> jobs. So Frischoff's really interesting in that his own personal um, journey into studying work is he was a professor, a college professor, and there's kind of a traditional path for professors, which is, you know, publishing peer-reviewed work and submitting different books and getting your PhD. And he really saw a new trend, which is, I want to study what really motivates people. I want to study work, which was very unconventional at the time. And a lot of his colleagues and, and peers told him, why do you want to study work? I mean, why does that even matter? And he said, well, there's this global phenomenon of, of unemployment and people are not finding joy in their work. And he actually says, which I really love, he says, work is like a mild disease. <laughs> people look at it like the common cold. They want it, they, they view it as something that they just want to end as quickly as possible. Yeah. And so Frischoff's what he's really trying to get at is not necessarily that every person becomes an entrepreneur and does that full time. But imagine a world and how much our culture would change if people had a job that kind of paid the bills, but then they also spent their free time really working and in their passion and what they really love to do. Yeah. And the implications of how our culture globally, not just in the United States, would really shift. Um, and so he actually shared this amazing story about it's so like look at a cab driver, for example. If you tell a cab driver that you have to drive this cab in Manhattan the rest of your life, he's like, it's like a death sentence. Yeah. Now imagine if you say you have to work this job three months a year and you're spending your free time really honing in on what you're passionate about. And so what he's saying, Felina, to your point about actually how the government is controlling the workforce, what he's suggesting is this isn't just, you know, start a business and, and live a full life. What he's suggesting is that the government actually put things in place that help people figure out what their passions are and how to actually actualize them, especially as jobs are scarce. Finding employment traditionally is not really working for most people, especially in third world countries. So actually having government funded programs that can help people learn about what they care about, that is what will spark a whole culture change and a shift towards entrepreneurism. And you know my passion lies in education mm -hmm. and really my true, true feeling that the education system as we know it mm -hmm. 
K through PhD even is really broken as it relates to some of these conversations because mm -hmm. we're training people to go be mm -hmm. in that industrial job, exactly. sit and go see, mm -hmm. learn, recite, you know, the, mm -hmm. every capital in the United mm -hmm. States. Who needs that anymore? Mm -hmm. We should really be teaching, you know, this entrepreneurial thinking, leadership, innovation, mm -hmm and thinking in a way that, to your point, Skylar, you know, what if you did something, you know, maybe to make some money, and we see this more and more, especially as coming out in the millennials, mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna go work my tail off, mm -hmm. make a bunch of money, and then spend the next nine months, you know, maybe doing what I'm passionate mm -hmm. about, how can I build that in to a new work mm -hmm. scenario now? And I think this is really exciting because it's a new conversation. Yes. Um, instead of focusing on, I have to find a job to make ends meet, really looking at what makes me really profoundly happy. Yes. <laughs> yes. And which is what Frischoff did, branching out and leaving you know, the traditional kind of teaching world and industry to really kind of spearhead this amazing discussion. And you know, this is, he's not just like a philosopher, he's actually contracted to work with different government advisors in, in different countries, specifically like in South Africa, he's done a lot of work on really changing, yeah. uh, changing the workforce in yes. third world countries yes. and actually teaching people entrepreneurism. Yes, I love the fact that you know, his statement was around, it's easier to go into really a poverty stricken country and, and convince the government powers mm -hmm. that this is a, a possibility and, and kind of starting with zero mm -hmm. versus coming into the US culture mm -hmm. where, again, we're all keeping up with the Joneses and inspiring mm -hmm. to keep the status quo because not to go conspiracy theory here, <laughs> but I mean, there are a lot of reasons why a lot of folks want to keep the status quo in this country. And so some of those ideas here seem pretty radical, whereas, you know, if you're starting with nothing, why not, so to speak? And to piggyback off of that, um, we've done a lot of research. Uh, every year, the General Monitor Report mm -hmm. comes out, and they really kind of study entrepreneurism and business globally. And one of the things that I see this having a direct impact on is the number of female entrepreneurs in third world countries has far surpassed that of men in third world countries, yes. too. So I see Frischoff's work directly correlating with that, too, really going to third world countries also and tapping into women who yes. traditionally in those countries are really staying at home or um, just supporting their husbands, looking at entrepreneurism for you is also an option and women are running with it absolutely <laughs> last point on that so so important you brought that up is the micro credit movement mm -hmm. and really really truly looking at you know what micro credit is doing to mm -hmm. entrepreneurship in these countries mm -hmm. as you mentioned and allowing women whether it's buying a cow <laughs> whether it's buying a flock of goats or whether it's allowing a woman to buy some material to mm -hmm. sew some garments and sell those, mm -hmm. and the pay repayment rates on those microcredit loans, and there's a lot of controversy around it too, this mm -hmm. is a whole other topic, mm -hmm. but uh, in a lot of cases this is like 98% because of this group mentality mm -hmm. and this supportive community mm -hmm. mentality that they're taking, mm -hmm. which I also <laughs> like to tie into co-working. Yeah. Because it's also that similar mentality is we're here to support each other, we're here together, and we're better together than on our own little mm -hmm. island.